a community of staff, students, graduates, and others associated with our total program. And giving us support today are Sarah Thompson and Chrissy Martinez. They'll be fielding your questions, et cetera, anything that you have, because there's going to be some time for that. I know I've missed the personal contact, and it, it's made it difficult, you know, with these COVID times, and I appreciate the chance to just spend time with you. I miss seeing everybody. I miss being in class with everybody. So thank you for coming out and supporting this. This is one of the ways that FSM is being creative and staying in community and promoting this wonderful work that we share. So who all of you have joined, thanks. I'm really happy to see you. Um, you know, the focus at FSM is more than just teaching massage technique. It is really about personal growth and awareness. And we use the vehicle of touch as a medium for this. And yeah, we share this. So even though we're not in physical contact today, we are able to communicate and share through the wonderful internet that we have. Our guest today is Dean Juhan, and Dean is somebody that I've been in association with for quite a while now. I discovered him as part of my Traeger practitioner. I am a Traeger practitioner, and Dean is one of the original, almost original Traeger teachers associated with Milton Traeger. Um, he's also the author of Job's Body and Touched by the Goddess. And if you're not familiar with Job's body, it is everything you wanted to know about the systems evolved in movement, how movement occurs, and why touch is so effective in working with people. Um, he's an internationally known teacher and instructor. And like I said, a direct descendant of the work of Milton Traeger. He spent years and years in direct contact with Milton Traeger. And He's been a body work practitioner for over 45 years. Um, so he's going to be sharing with us today, talking about his experience. We're going to have about an hour, and we'll have time the last 15 minutes or so for your questions. If you want to submit a question or a comment, you can do so by hitting the chat um, icon that is there. If you're on Facebook, if you're on YouTube, I'm not sure about LinkedIn, but there should be a chat, and those questions will go into Chrissy and Sarah, who will compile them, and then we'll have time to um, get those out. So, without ado, here it is. I'm Frank, and here's Dean Juhan, my Hello, friend, everybody. my instructor, mentor. Hey, Dean. Hello, Frank, and hello to all of you, and thanks so much for coming. I'm uh, very excited to have this conversation. And Dean is joining us from the West Coast. So, you know, he's three hours ahead of us or behind us time-wise. And so it's a little earlier for him. Still the morning there. So welcome, Dean. And I would like to start with having you talk a little bit about how you got started in this bodywork profession that you've been in for a good portion of your life, two-thirds of your life. Yes, it has been. <laughs> When I look back at it, I go, oh, my goodness, how did that happen? Where did that go? Well, I got into uh, body work quite by accident. I was in Berkeley, where I am close to now, studying for my Ph.D. in English literature. And it was during a summer break, and I was sitting around my studio apartment with a friend of mine who said, Hey, have you ever been to Esalen? And I said, what, what's that? And he said, well, it's a place down in Big Sur. And I said, well, where's that? And he just said, get in the car. <laughs> so we drove down uh, past Carmel, winding our way through Big Sur, and finally got to the top of the hill in the Esalen Gate. It was late at night. Uh, the uh, property was closed, but he said, I know a way to sneak in. And I always repeat that because that was kind of my introduction to body work. I snuck in. <laughs> so we were down at the baths and, uh, you know, through this little sneak path, uh, Esalen has a marvelous hot springs hot tub system down overlooking the ocean, surf coming in. That night, 
It just happened to be the night of my 28th birthday. For those of you who have any interest in astrology, that's right smack in the middle of your Saturn return when everything that's not nailed down gets swept off the deck and life changes in a big way. And I was sitting there looking at the full moon, five planets across the ecliptic, just an enchanted evening. And somebody came up behind me and started rubbing my shoulders. And I didn't see them. I just felt their hands. And within about three minutes, my brain was laying in gears and wheels all over the bathhouse floor. And I didn't know what had hit me, but I knew it was phenomenal. Uh, to make a very long story somewhat shorter, I ended up staying at Esalen for the rest of that summer and became so engaged with what was happening down there with the human potential movement and body work uh, going on of all kinds, uh, all kinds of experimental and innovative uh, cognitive uh, psychological workshops. That was one of the cradles of group therapy and uh, many other kinds of therapeutic innovations that were uh, splashing themselves out onto the professional table during the uh, 70s. This was about 1974, by the way. And within fairly short order, a matter of months while I was there working at various other odd jobs to keep food on my plate, um, I got a job on the Esalen Massage Crew. And um, I was totally freelancing. Nobody really had taught me massage. Uh, but I discovered that I had a, a deep love for it. And if I may say so, uh, a, a natural gift. And uh, so I didn't have to go through a lot of hoops to get on the massage crew. I ended up working on that Esalen Massage Crew for a little over 19 years. And that was really the beginning of, of my immersion in body work uh, in, a, in a very big way. And, and uh, as I mentioned a moment before, the body work that I was doing as a part of that massage crew there at Esalen was completely immersed in the total Esalen program, which was uh, dietary changes for people, which was kind of psychological work, both individually and groups, that they were doing simultaneously during their stay at Esalen. All kinds of cognitive workshops, exploring new frontiers in psychology and neurology and physiology and physics and you name it. It was happening there. All as a part of what they called at Esalen Institute, the human potential movement. Mm -hmm. So it was never just about massage for me when I started out. It was an immersion in a very large project to change the collective and individual mindset of people to try to stir our planet and our culture in a very different direction. So I got from the get-go that what I was doing down there in the baths with my hands was part of a very big picture of people uh, immersed in going through all kinds of psychological and cognitive changes in their lives. And that really set the table for me. And that's what my body work uh, has been about uh, uh, through, all, through all these years. We must reach the mind. And we, if we want to change the body, you have to change the mind. Well, I had been uh, working at Esalen for a number of years when this jolly little elf called Milton Traeger uh, came to Esalen to visit for, for a short time. Uh, I watched him do a demonstration one night for the uh, Esalen staff. And there's still a video there at Esalen of me uh, sitting in the front row right by Milton's table, watching him work for an hour or so with tears just streaming down my face. My, my T-shirt was wet. And uh, once again, I, uh, like those hands on my back in the baths, I wasn't sure what I was watching, but I knew it was revolutionary. And I wanted what this guy had. So 
I became uh, that very week one of his very first students. He was just beginning to teach his work. And uh, I stayed immersed in training with this little elf for uh, 24 years from that night forward until his death in the early 90s. And his work and what he was able to give me of his work and the changes that that put me through learning to do his work, which were enormous, changed the course of my life, much like that first night in the Esalen Baths. So those were the two enormous shifts in my entire life and career course and in my new career as a body work, an enormous shift in my focus of intention and my understanding of what body work was all about, which, as Milton Traeger taught me, was really mind work. <clears throat> I, I was, it, yeah. I, I was going to say, Dean, you know, um, the, I, one of the things I've said in class, you know, when I taught kinesiology, was teaching kinesiology, was, was a quote from Milton. Um, Muscles are dumb. It's the mind I'm after. And that was so important for me to get that because I got to Traeger work because of pain in my own body. And it was an attempt to deal with that and it was actually successful and it was actually about my thought processes, not about my physical process. My physical process, which was efforting, got in the way of my being able to do body work. Exactly. And one of uh, Milton Traeger's seminal comments, which he repeated many times in class, that is always stuck in my mind from beginning to end, for every dysfunctional and uh, limiting uh, uh, situation in the body, there is a corresponding dysfunctional pattern in the mind mm -hmm. to the extent of the body's restrictions. And the body and the mind are absolutely glued together. We use two words, but in our physiological, neurological reality, there is no body and mind. There is a 100% integrated system of one nervous system. I like to think of our muscular structure as really just one muscle. It's divided into various compartments. And the mind is at all times controlling all the little flickerings of lengthening, shortening, providing bracing at the core, keeping everything else still and out of the way so unwanted movements are not taking place. And in order to change those restrictive patterns in the body, we have to change the restrictive patterns in the mind. And this extends in so many directions. Uh, it is our belief systems. What have we been told? What sort of a family did we grow up in? What do we imagine is possible for ourselves? What do we believe is impossible for ourselves? Um, what are the ethoses among which we have been raised and nurtured and grown up and presently operate in our social lives? What are our personal relationships like? All of those uh, arenas are the arenas in which the mind plays itself out in this thing we call a life. And the work, Milton's work, and now my work, is really about reaching that nervous system and reaching it with conscious sensory awareness and reaching beyond the conscious mind into the unconscious mind where so many of our psychological and our corresponding physical patterns have become trapped in our bodies and trapped in our worldviews and trapped in our sense, limited sense of self. Um, so that kind of in a nutshell has been, has been the uh, focus of my work from meeting Traeger onward, uh, that we are really working with the nervous system. And Milton used gentle pleasuring, aqueous, rhythmically waving movements through the tissue to do, number one, use the gentle pleasuring movement of that tissue 
to awaken sensory awareness. Yeah. And that for me is the bedrock of coming to terms with where we are and coming to terms with how we may change. If you can't feel it, you don't even know you're holding it. And if you can't feel it, you for sure can't change it. And if I'm not feeling it with you, I cannot in any successful, consistent way help my work to guide you into a better, more open, more inclusive sensory awareness through which your mind can operate to open increasingly uh, 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 beckoning doors to using that sensory awareness through our guidance process together to shift your consciousness and to shift your body's patterns and your aches and your pains and your fears and your distresses into a better and better and better situation for yourself. You know, one of the things that, <clears throat> you know, that has come to me, you know, over the years of doing body work, and that's the idea of feeling which is what you're talking about. And one of the things that I really got out of my study with you and, you know, again, the channeling of Milton Traeger is, you know, this, this idea of the unconscious and how so many patterns are running at any one time. And as you put out, until you become aware through feeling, it's really hard to replace them. And, you know, one of the things I love about watching you work and about what I've learned about the work is helping somebody feel what they want to feel rather than get rid of what they don't. Because it's really hard to get rid of something. What am I going to replace it with? Exactly. And I spoke a few moments ago about pleasuring the tissue, which was such a huge component of Milton Traeger's work. And I want to say... I do not mean pleasuring the tissue in anything like an erotic sense. I mean pleasuring the tissue to give the person the feeling that they do have a body that in many ways is capable of feeling delicious and inviting and at home, uh, regardless of the aches and pains they may present to me when they first come into my studio. So pleasuring awakes the mind to want to feel the tissue. Feeling the tissue leads the mind to the realizations of what is stuck, what is restricted. And exploring that sensory awareness of the stuck places and using this gentle, pleasuring, waving motion through the tissue to increasingly raise sensory awareness from skin to bones gives the client the tools they need to work with within themselves in conjunction to me, with me to change their habits, change their situation. And I want to pick up on what you said about the unconscious because uh, I think for me there are three 90%. 90% of your body's tissue is devoted to supporting movement. That is your skeleton, your entire musculature, autonomic as well as skeletal, your entire connective tissue system. And that is about 90% of who you are. And this next 90% came to me from a astonishing neurologist named uh, Sperry, S-P-E-R-R-Y. Uh, Google that name and you'll find his website, a trove of neurological information. But Roger Sperry said near the end of his Nobel winning career that as far as he could assess through all of his research, 90% of the nervous system is involved in one way or another with organizing muscular movement. So 90% of our body's tissue is movement tissue. 90% of our nervous systems is devoting is devoted to monitoring, controlling, and taking care of the learning processes in that, in that movement situation. And the third 90% is 90% of that motor control and 
of the habituated patterns that we have developed for ourselves exists at the unconscious level. Much of that has to take place on an unconscious level because if I had to think through how to raise my arm and extend it in space, I would never get my hand out there because what is involved with that simple gesture is hundreds of billions of molecular events taking places at synapses, taking places in myosinactin chains, taking place in the movement of my connective tissue. And all of that is such a complex ball of wax that my conscious mind could not possibly monitor that process. My conscious control is my intent. And the execution of that intent is 90% unconscious. And the execution of that intent therefore runs into all the previously historically embedded patterns of movement so that my intent becomes limited and jangled by habits I have developed. And so much of that is happening on the unconscious plane. And that is the focus of the work for me, to bring sensory awareness up to the surface bring much of that unconscious organizing process up to the surface and begin to really be able to track the disjuncture between my intent and the garbling of that intent by all my habituated patterns Mm -hmm. and my habituated beliefs and begin integrating those processes on a very new basis and a very new level. This is not what you're stuck with. This is what is possible for you. Mm-hmm. You are not your pain. You are so all, also a vessel of rich sensation and rich feeling and a new experience that you can use to supplant your old experiences and beliefs of I am pain, I am disability, I am who I am in this present moment, and that is that. So one of the things I'm hearing is that when you're working with somebody, you're really working to bring them to a present state of being where they can actually feel what's happening in their tissue. Yes? Exactly. Exactly. And so as a practitioner now, not so much the client, but as a practitioner, why is awareness and presence so important in that process? Well, as I began saying, uh, that uh, to me, sensory awareness is the bedrock of all of it. Without feeling, we can't change. And without better feelings, we can't change for the better. Um, So the work is really focused between myself and my client on both of our awareness and tracking of sensations I'm producing with my gentle movements and my exploratory movements, their response to those sensations, and my response to their response. Milton used to say that from a feeling in my mind, and we can talk about this later, Frank, but from a feeling of freedom and possibility and open into development that I have learned to develop and carry within myself, from my mind, through the movement of my uh, body and my hands and my tissue to the client's tissue and from the awakening of the sensations in the client's tissue to the client's mind. So from mind to my movement to the client's movements to the client's mind is the bridge that we are negotiating at all times. And presence for both of us here and nowness in the moment for both of us, is the essence of that process. Milton's work was not a protocol-oriented work. Here are the 10 steps you go through for a first session. Uh, Here are the collection of tools that you use for a massage session. Milton's work was a constant asking, responding, exploring from one development to the next in a rather unpredictable kind of way as the client's presence and my presence slowly begins to unfold this process of exploring what is possible, exploring what is pleasant, 
exploring how we negotiate the edges of those of those uh, uh, restricted patterns. And the body is always in the now. It is the mind that becomes obsessed with the past, the mind that becomes obsessed with the future, and the mind that tangles up those obsessions, clouding the awareness of the present moment, what is true now. And this is what the meditators and the yogis have been saying for millennia. The contact with that moment of nowness is the gate to development. Now is not the past that you'll never change. Now is not the future, which is indeterminate, despite all your obsessing about it. Now is where we are now. The body in its collection of awarenesses and sensations and monitoring of gazillions of physiological process, processes that keep us alive is always in the now. And connecting directly with our felt sense of the body, my shared sense of my felt sense of your body, brings us into that moment of now where change can happen. I like to think of it as a, as a, as a exchange between karma and grace, okay? Karma it, is everything that has happened to you. And uh, unfortunately, I have to tell you, you're never going to have a better past. And karma is what has set the stage for your now. And there is a momentum to that karma and the repetitions of the past that mm -hmm. keep me on the trajectory I am on, uh, be it uh, degenerative and increasingly catastrophic or being it towards development. Well, in the momentum of that karma, if we are in the now with my intent, your feeling, my feeling, your tissue, your responses to my movement, my responses to your responses, your response to my responses to your responses, and so on down the line in this exploratory path together, there emerge little what I call bubbles of grace. A moment of, oh, that's what my unconscious mind has had me trapped into. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's how a freer, lighter, movement can happen that is how a more sense of ease and peace and at home in my own skin feels like in the moment and those little bubbles of grace are extraordinarily potent those are the opportunities that arise as a happening at various times during the session and those little moments of awakening and grace are the force that can deflect the karmic momentum of that wheel and set us off in a better direction. So, yes, we are dealing with our past, but we are dealing with our past in the present. And the present offers those bubbles of insight, those bubbles of epiphany, of, oh, this is how it could feel. Mm -hmm. This is how it was meant to feel. I, there is a way out of that momentum of my past. There is a way towards a more developmental and a more expansive future for me. And that is the point of the work. You know, for me, I, I remember because there was a life-changing moment for me. Um, happened in the blue room at the massage school. A trader teacher, Catherine Hansman Spice, and she told that story of brain through tissue to tissue through brain and this ongoing kind of infinity curve of this conversation that was going on. And I had such an epiphany, a light bulb went off and it went, oh my God, what am I doing to people? Because I was efforting mm -hmm. to do something. You and find it, a tight, you find a tight muscle, you find yeah. a little bunching of connective tissue, yeah. and you get in there and you drill in on it, and you try to soften it. The problem is not in the muscle. No, the it was in my mind. In mind. Yeah, That's it was right. in my mind. Yeah. Both as a practitioner and a client. Yeah. And uh, you know, I, I I'm a believer in whatever uh, kind of modality you find that works for yeah. yourself because there are many approaches, but I feel very strongly 
that if the practitioner's focus is in on trying to get get in there and rub away with force the tightness of a muscle, you are potentially heading down a very narrow, limited pathway. Because so the a- problem of the tightness in the musculature system is not in the muscles. As you said earlier, as Milton said, muscles are dumb. All they can do is respond to signals the mind is sending to it through the sensory motor system and the synaptic system. If we can't backtrack our way up to that system to shift the mind in its sensory awareness and its more expansive feeling state and shift the mind in terms of its belief of what I am and what I must be and what is true, if we can't change those beliefs and change those feeling states, nothing of any lasting value is going to happen. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, and I like what you say, it doesn't have to be Traeger work. It can be any form of body work. The object becomes to listen and respond, to have a conversation with the tissue, and to find what's appropriate through that interaction between both uh, myself and the client. Well, let's take an example uh, of, of Rolfing which has long, long been viewed as a specific physical manipulation of connective tissue, which can often be quite uncomfortable and even very painful. And Ida said when she was teaching her early students her work, she said, their pain is not your concern. You're here to work on the connective tissue. And that was the table that was set for that deep tissue, often high degrees of pressure, trying to push tissue around and make it work on a purely physical level. I listened uh, over the last several months to a number of podcasts that were done by present Rolfing senior practitioners and instructors in the work. And I was blown away. They were talking about the necessity of listening to and reaching the mind. Mm -hmm. And if you do not engage that mind, muscular, patterning uh, thing that is, after all, what sets up connective tissue for gluing, for restrictions, uh, for all the rest of it, connective tissue is just responding to the muscle's movements. The muscle's movements only happen through the mind. These senior offer practitioners of late are talking about the absolute necessity of engaging that 90% mental part. Because if they're working through habituated muscular resistance, that's what makes it painful. And if they can reach the mind, relax the motor patterns, dealing with whatever specific connective tissue glitches that they've been trained to work with, is so much easier and so much less uncomfortable. I, I want to recount a little anecdote of myself while I was at Esalen uh, vis-a-vis this uh, revolution in, in uh, rolfing technique. Uh, when I first got there, there was this huge smorgasbord of body work, and rolfing was very big in its early development at the time. And I said, well, I have to experience that. So uh, my rolfer that I chose there at Esalen was a very big, boned, muscular, powerful guy. And my first one or two sessions were indeed highly uncomfortable. But by the third and fourth session, I found that working with Keith, this big muscular guy, was shifting from just trying to shove my tissue around to listening to my tissue respond to his hands. And by my fourth session, I was going to sleep while he worked on me. Mm -hmm. It was that not uncomfortable. And this is a revelation for me. And this was a revelation of late in the Rolfing world. All modalities are awakening to this thing that the buzzword that is so up is mindfulness. Mm -hmm. And mindfulness can be a bedrock part of any modality whatsoever. 
all that means and all that that revolutionary transition means is you're not just going through your repetitive protocol to do this or that to the tissue. In the midst of that protocol, you are listening to the tissue's response and you are observing the client's progress of response through that session. And you stay connected in the present moment with the client in response to whatever it is your modality is leading you to do. And uh, this can work with any protocol. It just means getting woke, getting present, not just r running through a checkoff list of moves you've learned to do or using the six or eight tools you've learned to do in Swedish. But whatever tool you're making at that moment of contact, be connected be in the now and be observant of the clients now and evoke the clients verbal response to their now so we get on the same page as we work together this transforms the relationship between practitioner and client it is no longer me the expert delivering uh, some protocol that i believe is going to help you to your passive body this is a co-creation together and to emphasize with Milton's work and my work once again, that that is the protocol. I don't have a step of 10 moves I'm going to get through in a session. I don't have a protocol of six or eight or 10 or 12 tools that I'm going to be using. It is a constant exploratory, co-creative relationship that is unfolding. And I tell my clients... You are my best teachers. Mm -hmm. If during a session I don't come up with something new, I've stopped growing because I have to come up with something that is meeting your immediate personal needs. And it, it is through that exploration that I develop, that I learn new ways to reach this client's unique patterns and psychological, emotional responses. Uh, and so it is this constant searching, experimenting, uh, exploring, creative, interactive process in which the client-therapist relationship just dissolves and we are two human beings working on a common issue together and in that exploration together we reach the precincts of the mind both conscious awakening of sensory awareness and unconscious depths of where motor patterns are formed and habits get stuck into a freer world of better feeling, more peaceful feeling in ourselves and a more effortless execution of all of our movements without those habituated impediments of the past. One of the things, I, you know, you're talking about dancing listening and responding. And one of the things that I really like about it, if I come at it from that, the work stays novel and interesting. My feeling is if you're getting bored, you're not paying attention. Yeah. Yeah. You're, well, just, you're, you're just habitually you're just repeating. Rattling, habitually you're just repeating. Rattling through repetitions, as is your client. And mm -hmm. that's precisely what we both want to get out of. And it is very like dancing. What is the joy of dancing? It's the joy of that mutual connection and mutual response to one another's responses and not just stepping around your steps on the uh, Arthur Murray uh, instruction floor, mm -hmm. but using those steps to create with the music your own kinetic melody together and the joy of that mutual interaction and learning with a new partner to get smoother and smoother and more and more responsive until intention is just gone and your bodies are leading you through this beautiful thing together. Uh, so, the highlight of that is, is uh, uh, what do they call it? Uh, uh, the, the spontaneous exploratory dance. Yeah, That is all about just being awake to what your partner's next unexpected move is going to be and coming up with meeting that 
and steering it your own unexpected direction. It's improvisation. <laughs> improvisation. That's right. Because we are working with such a complex organism and so many complex systems that arrive at our karma and give us the possibility of grace that there is no repetitive protocol that is ever going to reach the depths of that complexity. It so is Dean, that, yeah. So where is your work going now? I'm, I'm aware that we're beginning to compress on time. And okay. so I wanted to, you know, what are you up to these days? Because, you know, things have changed and you've changed, you've grown. Um, what are what are you working on these days? Where Where's your focus? Well, let right. me say first, just in this uh, in this COVID time of isolation and lack of being able to come together in classes that we're in, I have been working more and more with this kind of medium, this uh, through the through the network and through our uh, verbal and visual uh, contact with each other. I have been developing a, a large uh, string of webinars, which I've been giving for yoga training classes, yoga students, massage students, uh, Traeger community. And let me say before I forget, all of those archived webinars that I've done to date and all webinars that I'll be giving in the future will be available to you. Please contact me. Uh, my email is my name. Let me spell it all closely for you. D-E-A-N-E-J-U-H-A-N, -E all small letters, at gmail.com. If you contact me and give me your email addresses, I will make sure that you are on the list to uh, take part in these webinars or to call up the webinars that have already been given in a recorded fashion. And my website, jobsbody.com, uh, also archives all of those webinars that have been taped and are available to you. So that's one of the big directions my uh, uh, COVID professional life has been taking. <clears throat> but on a deeper level with the work itself, I had uh, about 15 years ago, maybe it's a little more than that now, a an epiphany working on a student in a class doing a demonstration. And so much of Milton's work is focused on softening, freeing, relaxing, opening, and gentle movements sent rippling through the client's tissue and that response loop going back and forth. Well, I was doing all my gentling, rippling, exploratory moves on this woman's shoulder on the demo table, and absolutely nothing was happening. No change in her resistance patterns. And I stepped away from the table in a moment of panic saying, okay, I'm just about to send these 25 students off into doing something that they just watched not work. What am I going to do here? And I have to say, a bolt from the blue happened in my mind at that moment. And I completely shifted my approach and what I was doing. And I stepped up to this woman and her arm and shoulder and I said, this is not working. We're going to try something different. I had no idea what I was even going to do. And I said, I'm going to traction your arm out away from your spine until we reach the limit of your habituated lengthening uh, uh, capacity. I'm going to hold that resistance with the traction. And pulling against my resistance, you're going to draw your shoulder blade slowly over towards your spine we're going to hold that for a moment. And then keeping that traction resistance uh, established with me, you're going to slowly lengthen that shoulder out. On that first pass, her shoulder blade came away from her spine another inch. And I did several more passes of the same thing, not having any idea what I was doing. That shoulder just in a matter of five or six minutes, 
fell completely apart from its old restrictive patterns and was the freest, most childlike, open, free, delicious sensations, lack of restriction. And I just stepped back and I said, I don't even remember what the title of this workshop was, but forget it. This is what we're going to do the rest of our time together. And that is where a fundamental shift took place in my work, which I've been developing since that time over uh, probably near to two decades now, which I call resistance and release work. The process is lengthening a muscle as long as far as it is comfortably able, providing resistance to contract fully through that range of motion, consolidate the strength of that contraction, maintaining resistance against my hands, slowly begin lengthening those fibers, and lo and behold, I have to say, every time, I find more length possible at the end of a controlled contraction and a controlled lengthening. Now, there are many uh, modalities that, that use resistance uh, to... Uh, a, a excite a muscle pattern into into uh, operation and then release it. But every one of them that I've seen in demonstration is a isometric contraction. And it is a, a, a pressure against a fixed, uh, stable place in space. What this resistance release work has opened up for me is if we don't just include a static isometric contraction, but include a movement all the way from full lengthening through the range to full shortening, strengthen that contraction, maintain that resistance through the range of full lengthening. There are so many more opportunities for that release to happen and such a more powerful stream of sensations through that movement through the resistance that is awakened in the client that fundamental brainstem patterns and spinal cord reflexes begin to organize and re-coordinate with astonishing speed and uh, this this development has absolutely transformed my work and it made me realize that the gentling the relaxing the letting go, all of that was half of the work. That was kind of erasing off the blackboard what has already been written. But through this active, interactive, working with resistance through full length, through contraction, and back again, we are writing something new on that blackboard. What does it feel like to coordinate, not just have a better feeling, but what does it feel like here and now to coordinate a fuller, less effortful, and more expansive movement that reorganizes on the synaptic level, at the brainstem level, at the spinal cord level, at the reflex response levels? And this work has absolutely transformed my clients and transformed myself. And that's, that's the big development that I am... am uh, beyond the web, uh, developing over these last couple of decades. And so, if this sounds like something interesting to you, you can explore more of it by going to Dean's website, jobsbody.com. And he also has been a regular um, visitor to the Florida School of Massage, coming at least once a year, um, sometimes twice a year, presenting this work. And if you watch our website about workshops and upcoming things, you might find him there. Um, it is pretty amazing stuff. And I see Sarah, so I'm guessing we have some questions. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, no? Yes, Sarah? can you hear me now? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I can hear you now. <laughs> okay. well, by the way, let me just briefly say something about my experience coming to the Florida School of Massage. It is one of the best massage schools I have ever worked in nationwide because it began with this human potential uh, as the basis of its work and not just teaching Swedish protocol and what have you. And such a rich 
stream of instructors from many walks of uh, the body work life are coming through that. And what I found with so many massage schools is that their founders that were engaged in that human potential perspective just age out and get tired of running the school. They sell the school and who buys them? Japanese corporations who operate on an ITT tech model and it becomes a repetitive protocol training process. Florida School of Massage has kept that human potential flame alive and the richness and the depth of exploring our lives together and not just applying a protocol of technique that you're going to learn in your 500 hours. So that's my little pitch for your school, Frank. It is continuing to do just top drawer work in a world that is becoming more and more technical and more and more repetitious. It is a special place. It's one of the things that keeps me there. Sarah, questions or comments? Well, I so much appreciate what, you're, what you've been sharing. And there's lots of hellos from familiar people like Annalisa and Caroline. Um, and there's a... Oh, oh yeah. And, hi. <laughs> and there's um, a question from Heath Lynn that says, yes, the mind is sending out instructions, but what about when there's a nervous system or anatomical damage? Can that be overcome somehow through uh, Traeger work or your approach to body work? Well, oh, very good question. Well, two things. <clears throat> one, th one thing that science used to tell us is that if neurons have been killed and if damage has happened neurologically, there is no hope. You're not going to develop new neurons. Uh, you're born with what you've got. And when those neurons die out for one reason or another, aging out or trauma, the, the nervous system just loses more and more and more neurons. These, in terms of an injury, which I think you're asking about, can be very local at the spinal cord level. Uh, and what neurologists now know is that, yes, indeed, you can develop new neurons and you can develop uh, a very different sprouting system of dendrites between neurons that can give the brain a kind of, and the spinal column and our nervous systems, a kind of plasticity that no one ever dreamed yeah. about 10 or 15 years ago. And this is one of the enormous uh, dimensions of research in neurology right now. How can the brain fundamentally change its structure and fundamentally change its available neuron pool? Now, I feel that, that uh, Milton Traeger's work capitalizes on that possibility of neuroplasticity, that if certain circuits are out, we can start to use new circuits. We can start to build dendrite bridges across that uh, outage of neuronal connection. And even in seemingly untractable limitations of movement and paralysis, new, uh, 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 new motor units can be sparked into action. One of the things that happens with that kind of neurological damage is the doctor tells you, you're never going to use that arm again. You've had polio.